All right. Wow. Um, unexpectedly awesome turnout. Hi. Um, my name is Lop. I'm Michael Lop. I'm the head of engineering here at Pinterest. Welcome, all of you, the plethora of you, to the uh, Discover Pinterest event. Discover Pinterest event, this is the second one of these large scale ones that we've done. The last one was about cloud. We had the CTO of Amazon here. Um, we want to get a perspective about a certain piece of technology. We want to go a little deep on it. We want to hang out with our fellow nerds, engineers, all the things that we are here, and continue to learn. So thank you all for all of you for coming. Um, this tonight is um, going to be, if we can bring the agenda slide up, is going to be about discovery and search. You probably know what search is. I just want to quickly tell you how I view discovery. Discovery is, if you think about Google, any Google people in the room? Show of hands. I don't know, how's it going? Nice. If you're thinking about Google, um, it's there's a very interesting, um, if you're looking for, if you know exactly what you want, you go to Google. They're really good at giving you an answer to a specific question. We view as discovery as the means to find the things that you may not know that you love. And there's, a, it's a very simple thing, but there's a lot of technology behind it. What we've done today, um, starting with um, Hugh Williams, from, who's graciously uh, decided to join us from uh, Pivotal Labs. He's going to give us sort of an overview. And then we're going to go deep on a couple of different areas relative to Pinterest technology. Um, we have Hui, who runs, is going to give us a discovery overview. Charles is going to give us the life of a Pinterest search query. We'll do, Hui is going to do search guides. And we're going to finish with Kevin, who has something at the end of his talk that's pretty cool. It's worth it. <laughs> Hang around. OK, so with that, I want to uh, uh, bring up uh, Hugh Williams, who's going to lead us off with a whirlwind tour of search. Thank you. I'll just keep talking until you can hear me. Oh, you can hear me now. All right. Well, welcome. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing crowd. So um, hello to everybody up the back in particular. Um, so my slides are going to take a couple of seconds to come up. I, I, I promised a whirlwind tour of, of search engines today, and that's uh, what I'm going to really try and do. So I'm going to uh, kind of bounce across the top of a whole ton of topics uh, around search, and, and I guess do my best to share um, my 23 years of experience in working on search. Um, I just this is my the first job I've taken actually uh, over the last year is, is the first job I've ever had that hasn't involved search. Um, so I'm going to talk about everything that's uh, that kind of predates um, predates that. Um, let me go to the clicker. All right. So I thought um, I thought just to ground us a little bit, I'd talk a little bit about querying. Um, so there's this really interesting guy, Andre Broder. Uh, he works at uh, Google right now. Um, he wrote this really really interesting paper back in 2002, and he basically said, "Hey, people use search for three things." Finding out stuff, informational queries, getting somewhere else on the web. Um, back at the back at the kind of start of Google, that used to be a really really big deal, uh, going somewhere else on the web. You know, search was the thing you used to go somewhere else. That kind of became became uh, less of a user scenario over time, and it's now become very very popular again. Uh, or they want to do something. Um, and you know, I spent uh, the, about five years before my current job working at eBay, where the primary thing that folks wanted to do when they used a search engine was buy something. So that was a really good example of, uh, of doing something transactional um, with a search engine. Um, you know most of the, of the things that are on this slide. Um, users strongly prefer querying using ranked queries. So they like typing two or three words into the search engine, and they expect the search engine to understand those two or three words and deliver great results. Um, the mean query length, uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to work for a search engine company to know exactly what the mean query length is today, but, but I'll, I'll take a punt and say it's probably still less than three words per query, though a lot of customers now make use of the auto-suggest type features um, to pick a query that somebody else has typed, and that's probably driving an increase in the length of that query, and I'll take a punt that the median length of queries is probably still two. Um, users are very, very impatient, so about half of users will submit one query per session. It's a tough, tough gig, right? So if people type two or three words, they press enter, and if you don't deliver what they want in the first page of results, most customers will give up and go do something else. Um, there's a long tail on that distribution, so you, you know around 30% of folks uh, will submit three queries or more, so they'll, they'll work through a whole bunch of query refinement. 
Um, one, of the, one of the intuitions that I think a lot of people have when they work on search is, well, let's, let's improve search by adding lots of advanced features. Um, you know, let's, let's try and help customers by either adding visual features that help them do search or let's add sort of operators that help them work with the search engine. It turns out those are historically very, very unpopular. Um, so very few folks make use of the Boolean features that search engines provide and very few customers make use of the phrase querying features that search engines provide. And in fact, if you go and look at phrase querying as an example, if you sort of go and look at the, the set of queries that customers express using quotation marks, you'll find a, a really large number of those the customers actually misuse the quotation marks. They'll put a quotation mark around a single word or they'll put a single quotation mark in a query. Um, so, so customers just expect to be able to type two or three words and have the search engine do its job. Tough gig. Um, answers, I don't know why uh, search engines return 10 results per page, but that's historically just what happens. <laughs> Um, I notice in Google today you can go to some of their advanced features and change the settings and actually get more results per page. I bet nobody does that. Everybody just expects 10 results per page. Um, I was very, very lucky in my time at Microsoft to be involved with the team that invented infinite scroll on the web. Um, that, was a, that was a bunch of fun. Um, that seems to be very popular now. Um, I see Pinterest has, has made use of that feature. You know, Google went on and made use of that feature. I think that feature makes a lot of sense when you build a visually rich search engine. I think it makes far less sense when you do text. And that's, I guess, why most search engines are stuck with 10 results per page when they're primarily in a textual mode. Uh, as I said before, users very strongly favor, and this is supported by a ton of research studies, they very strongly favor search engines that are very high precision. So what I mean by that is that they love search engines that return relevant answers near the top of the results. They're not at all concerned about, um, about finding every relevant result that matches, that matches their query. If you worked in the Department of Defense, um, you would have the opposite concern, right? You would, you would want to run queries and you'd want to find all relevant results that match your query, and you'd be okay about it being low precision. You'd be okay at sort of sifting through that to try and find information that matches your information need. But when you're, when you're in a web search mode, uh, that's not the case. Uh, about 75% of users uh, don't go beyond page one in web search. So again, one query, two or three words, you better deliver the results at the top of the page and they're not going to use advanced operators. Um, I'll just digress a little bit and just tell you the story of, uh, of Infinite Scroll for a second. Um, so I was, I, was, I was lucky enough to be hanging out with a couple of people at uh, Microsoft in uh, 2006 and uh, we were looking at how image search worked back, back in the day. So you'll remember image search had 20 images per page and then had a, had a kind of next. So if you ever used uh, traditional image search back then, uh, you'll, you'll probably remember that. Um, when we looked through the sessions that, uh, that uh, customers were, were, were giving us at the search engine, um, what we discovered was that that 75% threshold wasn't hit till page seven in image search. So users are much more likely to paginate in image search than they are in web search. And that was the moment that Infinite Scroll was invented because we decided that, hey, you know, you, we need to provide more results per page. Why have this barrier of pagination? And so Infinite Scroll became, became something. So speaking of infinite scroll, I, I, I typed in uh, one of my favorite queries on any search engine. Uh, this query here is uh, vintage baseball bobbleheads. Uh, I collect those. Uh, my wife's been very kind and kind to let me uh, put up a big acrylic display cabinet in our living room, uh, which is full of gold-based bobbleheads. So I'm particularly obsessed with uh, bobbleheads that were produced between 1966 and 1970 that have a gold base. Um, you'll see a couple of those, a couple of those up there. And I thought I'd try that, uh, try that query on Pinterest. Um, I bring that query up because I just want to use it as an example of how sort of search works in a very, very simple sense. Um, so consider the query vintage baseball bobbleheads. If you were building a search engine, there's probably two things that you would intuitively arrive at fairly early in your exploration of building some kind of ranking algorithm to, to deliver results for customers. The first thing that you'd arrive at is that you would probably decide that you should have some sort of ranking factor in your, in your ranking algorithm that powers your search engine that relies on uh, counting the number of times that the words that the customer has provided occur within the documents in the collection. And your intuition would be if a document has terms from the query many times, it's probably more relevant to the, to the customer. Kind of makes sense. The other thing that I think you'd arrive at that's sort of the, the yang to that yin is you'd arrive at this idea that there's some sort of discriminating power that comes with each of the terms, which we call inverse document frequency. I've given you an example here. 
And that is that I guess you'd probably agree that of the three words in my query, bobbleheads is probably a better discriminator between relevant documents that we might have in our search collection than, say, a word like vintage or baseball. You can imagine typing vintage and getting lots of things that weren't bobbleheads. But you can imagine typing bobbleheads and be sort of in the ballpark of giving me the kind of results that I want. So you'd probably arrive at thinking that those two things were sort of important components of, of the search engine that you wanted to build and the ranking function that you wanted to build. Um, if you did that, you've, re you've, in you've reinvented something called TFIDF that you've probably already heard of. Um, sort of information retrieval, people kind of throw this around all the time. They say we've got a TFIDF based ranking function um, in our search engine. Um, you'll hear fancy words like a copy BN25, you'll hear vector space model, you'll hear these sorts of phrases. At the core, most of these rely on this very simple idea of term frequency and inverse document frequency. The more a word occurs, the better. The more discriminating a word is, the more weight it gets in the ranking function. Um, you'll also find that information retrieval people love logs. So you'll often, when you see the, when you see the functions, um, you sort of pull them apart, you'll typically see that there's a log involved. You might ask why, why are there logs in these ranking functions? I guess the intuition is that if a term occurs once, that's, that's a great indication. If it occurs twice, that's a big deal. If it occurs five times, that's an even bigger deal. But if it occurs 50 times, is that much better than it occurring 10 times? Mm, probably not. So they tend to sort of damp the weights using logs. There's no scientific basis that I can find for using logs. It just kind of works. And you'll see that information retrieval people sort of throw logs around all the time to kind of make their systems work. Um, so there's a typical TF IDF ranking function. Um, you'll, you'll usually see it written as TF.IDF, sometimes TF minus IDF. Doesn't mean that they're going to be subtracted. It's the same, uh, the same kind of idea. Um, you might ask, well, is that what Google does? Is that how Bing works? Is that what you did at eBay? Is that maybe what the Pinterest guys are doing? I'd say it's probably part of the story. Probably at the core of their ranking function are uh, those two very important concepts. There's probably a few other concepts as well. But at a global level, they're doing a few things different. And I wanted to just talk about those um, for a moment. So first of all, maybe one of the big secrets of search as it's, as it's kind of emerged on the web and as it's changed from sort of the library science domain that it began in, is that most search engines don't really do pure ranking. What they typically do is they do a giant Boolean AND between all the query terms, and then they do some ranking over the results that come back. So if you take my query uh, vintage baseball bobbleheads, what most search engines are going to do is they're going to find the documents that contain all three of those terms, throw away everything else, and then they're going to rank across that set of documents that contain all three of those terms. You might ask, why? Um, there's a couple of really good reasons. Um, and it turns out both sort of camps within the search engine company turn out to be happy. So the first, the first camp that's happy is the infrastructure guys, because it saves a ton of computation. So doing this Boolean AND and then the ranking is a really good thing for the infrastructure guys. They like that. Uh, probably the accounting team likes it as well. The other guys that like it are the ranking guys, because it turns out that this drives up precision. Right? So if you throw away the documents that don't contain all three words, guess what? You're more likely to have relevant results at the top of the search results. So everybody's sort of happy with this idea, um, and it's not sort of terribly often questioned uh, in, in modern search companies. Um, you'll be able to go away, though, tonight and run a query that, and then come back to me and say, I found one that's not like that. I found one where I typed three words, and I went and really carefully inspected the document, and all three words aren't in the document. Um, you'll be able to trivially do that. Um, there's probably two reasons that's happening. The first is there is text associated with that document that isn't actually in the document. So there's things like the URL. There is anchor text on the web that points to that document. Right, so if I'm authoring a page and I point to that document, I'm going to create a piece of text that describes that document. So it could be matching against that text and not the text within the document. So that's one answer I'll give you. The other answer I'll give you is I'll say, well, it, the, the search guys are doing something a little bit more complicated. What they're doing is they're taking your query vintage baseball bobbleheads and they're doing some pre-processing on that to modify it a little bit. So they're not so naive that they'll throw away documents that contain uh, bobblehead. Right? They understand that bobbleheads is a plural, and they'll also include documents that have bobblehead. 
So they're probably doing some translation behind the scenes to take my query vintage baseball bobbleheads and turn that into a much more complex query. And I'm not seeing that. So that'll be one, it'll be one of those two explanations. But by and large, they're really doing a Boolean AND before they do the ranking. Let's talk a little bit more about, uh, about what goes on in ranking. Um, I talked about two ranking factors, TF and IDF. Um, I hope you go away sort of remembering those two. They're really, really important. It turns out, though, that they're two of probably hundreds of ranking factors that are used in practice. Um, those ranking factors are usually combined using some kind of machine learned algorithm to produce the actual ranking function. You can imagine if you've got hundreds of factors, it's really hard as a human to sit down and sort of choose the constants that go with those. You know, which log should I use? Should I try one plus? You know, should I divide those two things by each other? It's very, it's very difficult as a human to sort of rationally understand that and, and, and make that work across a very large set of queries and a very large set of documents. So typically, what search companies do today is they produce a training set with some relevance judgments, and then they train a machine learned ranker to produce a machine learned function that they put into production. What are these other ranking factors? I'm going to talk about uh, three of them. I'm going to talk about sort of some query independent ranking factors in a moment. I'm going to talk about document streams, and I'm going to talk about query alterations. But there's lots of different buckets of factors that are used in, in, uh, in modern ranking. So query alterations is pretty cool. I just talked about this a moment ago. This is the idea that the search engine takes your original query and does some modification to that to hopefully improve your query and get the results that you're after. Um, the most sort of in your face version of that is, is automatic spell correction. So you make a trivial spelling mistake. The search engine today doesn't even sort of throw that in your face. It'll just quietly correct your query, make you feel good about it, and deliver the results that you, that you wanted. If it's not really sure, then it might show you a suggestion. It might say, did you mean? And that, that's where you sort of do the, you know, the palm slap in the head. You say, oh, I'm such a fool. Uh, but, but the search engine is not sure it should have corrected it. So it gives you a suggestion and allows you to make the choice yourself. Maybe it's even more subtle than that. Maybe it's sometimes giving you some results for your original query and some results for the corrected query kind of gently blended together. Uh, that also might be a way that the search engine can understand what you really meant and use that to help future customers. It can also, as I said before, be adding terms to queries. So it can do spell correction, it can, it can bring in alternate spellings. Um, you might detect from my accent that I'm from Australia, so uh, you know, I'm used to using lots of S's in words like recognized and, and so on, I don't use Z's. Um, we want that to work. You don't want, you don't want those things to, to not work for customers who are used to, to alternate spellings. Um, synonyms, I'll give you an example of that in a moment. So the queries are typically expanded to be much more complex than the customer originally provided. And those, and those terms can be used in a couple of different ways. So first of all, they can be used in ranking. So we can go and use that to produce a better set of results for the customer. And they can also be used in highlighting. So you're used to when you get back results from a search engine, you're used to seeing sort of these 10 results per page and you're used to seeing some words highlighted within those 10 results. Sometimes these query alterations might not be used in ranking, but they might be used uh, in highlighting the captions or snippets that are returned to you as a customer. A good example of that is acronyms. So if you type, uh, I don't know, NASA as your query, um, you might sometimes see within the snippets that you know the, 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 the National Aeronautic and Space Administration is actually highlighted within the captions, but maybe that's not actually used within the query. So you'll see that too. Um, let's talk about how that works in practice. Um, so let's just, let's just take a kind of fictional example. Let's imagine that there's lots of customers out there who are trying to type the query iPod, but they misspell it. So they just sort of make a slip on their keyboard and they spell iPod as IOPD. Pretty common kind of, pretty common kind of transposition mistake. Lots of those customers are gonna look at the results for IOPD and say, ugh, that's not at all what I meant. They're gonna jump back into the search box, they're gonna raise that query, they're gonna type iPod, press enter, and get a great set of results. And then they're gonna interact with those results. And so if you're a search company, you've now got a really beautiful trail that that user's left behind. They've said that IOPD is corrected to iPod and leads to a happy interaction with my search results. If you get enough customers providing you with that trail of information, then you can come to a belief that IOPD and iPod 
are equivalent and that IOPD should be corrected to IPOD. Um, I'm sure lots of you have worked on sort of large graph problems, sort of distributed graph problems. You can imagine this being a graph, right? So you can imagine having sort of nodes that are words and edges that are sort of your confidence of how the words relate to each other. And you can imagine sort of mining this graph at a very large scale to create these kinds of dictionaries that allow you to do spelling correction, that allow you to do query alterations, that allow you to highlight words, and so on. Uh, maybe I'll just give an editorial opinion. Um, I worked on Bing for a long time. Um, I often sort of sit back and wonder, you know, why isn't Bing the dominant, dominant search engine? Those guys have done some great things. And I think one of the reasons is they don't have as much data as Google. So if you have that much market share, you have vastly more data. And so you can do these kinds of things that we're talking about today much better. Right? If you've got less query share, you have less data, and you can't do these things as well. And most importantly, you can't do these things as well in the tail for those really hard queries that really, really matter to customers. Because you breed loyalty in a search engine if you can do the hard things well. Right? People care a little less about the easy things. So very, very hard if you're, if you're being to, uh, to win that game. Um, obviously, these kinds of approaches improve with more data, but they're, they're fraught with danger. So, for example, um, we might find that lots of customers type Prada, look at the results and go, oh, a little too expensive. Then they type Gucci, and I don't know if Gucci's cheaper or not, but anyway, let's suppose it is. And then they type Gucci, and then they interact. You might come to a belief through these automatic techniques that Prada, and Prada is a misspelling of Gucci. Right? I'm a, maybe a slightly extreme example, but, but you, could, you could come to belief, some belief that these things are the same thing, and they're clearly not. So you have to figure out how to kind of fix those sorts of problems. Um, you can make mistakes with ambiguous terms. So let's imagine that um, uh, we're all a class at the Central Michigan University. Um, we, might, we might go to our favorite search engine and type SingMU and get back these results and say, what the heck? There's no results for the Central Michigan University. So then we go up to the search box, remove that, and we type Central Michigan University, and then we interact with the search engine. So guess what we might learn from that? We might learn that CMU and Central Michigan University are equivalent terms. Um, now, for 99% of customers, we've just kind of screwed the pooch. Um, for the other 1%, we've made them really, really happy. Um, so as, as a set of folks that are working on query alterations, we kind of have to navigate our way through that world. Um, you can imagine that knowing where a user is, knowing the past behaviors of a user would be really, really useful in, in sort of solving that type of problem. Um, you could also aggressively correct reasonably unpopular queries, right? So somebody might type IPO and really mean IPO. Um, but again, for 99% of users, that might be iPod without the D. Um, we, don't want to be, we don't want to be making that correction uh, automatically. We probably don't even want to be showing that as a spelling suggestion at the top, because our smartest customers, the ones sort of on the, on the bleeding edge, you know, look at the search engine and go, come on, you know. Doesn't work on new terms. So as the world's changing, doesn't work, doesn't work on rare terms. Uh, I remember in my time at, I, my time at eBay, we, we ran into this problem many, many times. So, you know, I remember one day that uh, this, this company called Apple, you might have heard of them. Um, they released this thing called the iPad, you might have heard of that. And so, you know, eBay is suddenly flooded with iPads of people trying to flip, flip iPads and make a dollar. And our search engine is really, really sure that they mean iPod. <laughs> right. So that, uh, that, uh, that got me yelled at by the CEO and all sorts of people. Um, so that's query alterations. Um, let's, let's just talk a little bit about sort of things that aren't related to the query, um, but are more sort of properties of the collection. And I'm sure lots of people in this room have, have some experience with some of these things. Um, if you work on search, you, you kind of want to know how spammy things are. That, that turns out to be very important in a sort of unconstrained domain like web search. Um, so you want to know about the spamminess of domains. You want to know about the spamminess of pages. Um, that's not a property of the query. That's a property of the document, uh, of the collection. And that turns out to be important in ranking. Uh, adult, turns, adult scores turn out to be uh, really important uh, in ranking uh, because clearly if somebody has turned safe search on, you want to make sure that you provide them with a safe searching experience. Um, and so knowing you know, some adult score about each, each domain and about each page turns out to be really, really important in ranking as well. Little aside, uh, as I said, I was lucky enough to work on uh, image search at Microsoft. We built some really complex sort of stuff to, to do uh, uh, adult image detection. The big problem we had, the only story I wanted to tell you about it really, um, was that it kept thinking pictures of babies were adult. 
and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Close up of skin, lots of curves, you know. It's a real problem. So uh, I remember spending a good amount of time with the guys trying to sort of figure out how to stop babies being classified as adult. Um, really tricky problem. Page authority scores is another way of saying page rank. So clearly, you know, you want, you want to know how sort of authoritative a page is, how authoritative a site is. You know, that, that turns out to be relatively important. I mean, there's lots of basic interesting statistics that you want to collect about documents that you want to use in ranking. So things like word counts, how many, how many sort of inbound links there are to a document, how many outbound links there are from a document to another document. Uh, if you work at somewhere like eBay, you care, you care about how many times something's sold if it's sort of a fixed price item that has multiple, multiple quantities. Um, you care about how many times the documents are being shown to the customer. You care about how many times the document's been clicked on, probably on a per query basis, but also independently. So there's lots of sort of statistics you want to capture that are also used in ranking. So you can imagine if we kept on talking about this, that's what the dot, dot, dot for, the little ellipsis at the bottom, you know, you can imagine we could probably pretty quickly come up with 100 great ideas that we would think, hey, all of those feel intuitively like the kinds of things you would want in the ranking in a modern search engine. And then you can see us working our way back to probably wanting to start a machine learning ranking team that helps us figure out how to combine these factors uh, to come up with an overall ranking function. Just to make it even more complex, um, you also probably would get to this idea that you want to treat different parts of the document differently. So you might, you might think, for example, that you want to work with URL text, the text that you extract from the, from the URLs, you might want to work with that differently to how you work with the, with the uh, text that comes in the headings, the text that comes in the body of the document, maybe the anchor text that's inbound to the document. You might care about different properties and different, and, and different features of those, uh, of those different components of the document. So that's where this idea of streams is born where you treat different parts of the document in different ways. Each of those might actually have its own sub-ranker. There might be a little ranker that works for that component of the document, and then a main ranker that combines the scores from each of the sub-rankers to give you an overall score. So you can see very easily you could arrive at you know, many hundreds of ranking factors uh, really, really quickly. So let me just go away from ranking for a little bit and just sort of talk about architectural things for a moment. This is the world's most simplified diagram of a web search engine. Um, all I'm really trying to say here is that, you know, at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the diagram, you know, the search engine crawls the web. Of course, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're searching at a web search engine, you're not searching the web. You're searching a copy of the web that these guys are um, simultaneously discovering and refreshing. It turns out in crawling, that's a really hard problem. You know, how much new discovery to do versus how much refreshing to do while also trying to be polite. Um, crawling is a very hard problem, by the way. The first crawler that I was involved in building, um, you know, uh, did a lot of stupid things. Uh, I remember one day coming into the office in the morning, and it had been uh, sitting crawling a calendar overnight. So, uh, you know, it got started in uh, whatever this month is, November 2014, and it found a next link, and it went, I should go and crawl that. And it crawled that, and then I went and, you know, grabbed January and February and just kept on motoring. So I uh, came back the next morning and had a lot of copies of the calendar. Um, so I mean, okay, crawl a trap. You know, we have to figure out how to how to kind of work our way around that. So there's lots of sort of rules, heuristics, tricks in crawling. It's really not a trivial problem, and that idea of sort of balancing refresh with discovery turns out to be really, really hard. Um, the crawler stores its documents in some kind of document store. That document store is typically the place over which a lot of computation happens to produce graphs. We've talked about some uses of graphs, so things like spam detection, adult detection. Uh, the query sort of alterations type work, you know, lots of, lots of different graph computation problems. It's also the place that the index is constructed, and I'll talk about indexes in a moment, that are actually used to provide the, the, the search infrastructure. Uh, on top of that are some index file managers. I'm going to talk about those in a moment, but that's the actual sort of business part of where querying happens within the search engine. Uh, up on top of that is a results cache. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. And then some, some web serving infrastructure on top of that to interact with the, with the external customers. Um, so let's just talk about this sort of index serving, index file manager piece for a moment. Um, typically how it works, maybe it's just better if I, if I kind of uh, point, at the, point at the diagram. So I'll just go back a slide. I think I've got this funky laser pointer here. Um, this thing here is called a row. So uh, this, is, this is a set of machines that together have a complete copy of the collection. So if we've got uh, a million documents, 
and uh, we had uh, eight of these things in a row, then we would spread the one million documents across those eight machines. So we'd divide them evenly between those machines. When a query comes in from the top here, that query goes to every machine in that row. That machine computes its best results and sends those back. Those results are merged and given back to the customer. So the bigger the collection, the more machines you need in a row. So row widening is one of the sort of big tasks that, that has to be sort of automated within a search company, is as the collection gets larger, you need to distribute the collection across more machines. Um, the more machines you have too, by the way, the, the, uh, the less latency you have, because those machines are doing less work. Right? So again, if querying starts to get slow, you might widen the row um, to, to improve the latency of that particular row. You might ask, well, okay, so this is a complete copy of the collection, well, what are all these things? They're exact copies of that row. So there's many rows in the system. When one row is busy answering a query, uh, the other queries that are in the queue go to other rows. So again, if you want to sort of improve the throughput, if you want to reduce the length of the queue in your search engine, then you uh, add more rows. So the more rows, the more queries you can concurrently answer. The wider the rows, the lower the latency uh, within the system. So again, if you're building search infrastructure, if you're working on this kind of problem, um, you're probably pretty deeply involved in uh, the sort of algorithmics, the data center operations to uh, increase the number of rows and widen the rows and manage that while the system um, spends its whole time up. So that's rows. Um, I mentioned caching. It turns out that most web search queries have been seen before. Um, so in you know, rough ballpark terms, about 70% of the queries that hit a search engine in a given day uh, are repeat queries that have seen, been seen before in that day. So that's kind of cool. So if you can build a large enough distributed cache, um, you can actually avoid doing all that really hard work on that, on that sort of grid of index serving nodes. Um, so that's what search engines do. They have very, very large caches that sit on the front that serve most of the results for most customers. Um, it turns out that the key for the cache isn't, of course, just the query because Customers have lots of settings and preferences and locations and all sorts of things. So, you know, folks in different markets, so different countries typically, um, get different search results. Um, folks in different locations might get subtly different search results. We talked about the CMU example before. Um, language is important. There might be some personalization features in the engine that stop you being able to cache all of the results. Safe search settings, of course, are important, dot, dot, dot. So it's really not just a cache based on query, it's a cache based on you know, a large number of attributes. But nonetheless, you can typically serve a very, very large number of queries straight out of cache without ever going to that expensive index serving infrastructure. Um, so let's just talk about the expensive uh, index serving infrastructure for a second. Um, each of those nodes that's in that grid, those rows that have copied, um, its, its primary task is uh, to evaluate queries against a thing called an inverted index. And I'm going to show you a diagram of one of those in a moment. Um, these indexes are pretty much designed to have most of the ranking factors in them that you need to compute the ranking function. So the reality is not only that customers aren't searching the web, but they're searching a copy of the web, they're really not even searching the documents. They're searching an, a, a search structure, an inverted index, that contains all of the information that's needed to compute the ranking function. The documents are actually only retrieved when we need to compute those summaries to show to the customer at the very, very end of the querying process. Um, these indexes are highly compressed. There's a whole sort of art and science of, of compressing these indexes, and it typically about 10 to 20 percent of the size of the original collection that you're storing. So they're a relatively compact structure, but nonetheless, you know, very, very, uh, you know, very, very space intensive. Um, typically, have to be stored primarily on disk, um, and it's sort of the core of, of, of what goes on in, in search evaluation. Here's a diagram of one super simple diagram. I just kind of uh, made it as simple as I could for the purposes of our sort of whirlwind tour. Um, up here on the left, I've, I've sort of done an amateur version of a hash table. Um, that's a kind of sort of in-memory search structure that you might use for looking up words. Let's imagine I'm a customer who comes to the search engine and my query is cat. Um, this hash table might be used to look up the word cat. And we discover that the word cat does indeed occur somewhere in our collection of documents. Um, that word cat has a pointer over here to an inverted list. This is sort of the core of this, of this inverted in index structure. And this, and this list here tells me that cat occurs three times in my document collection. It's in documents numbers one, two, and seven. 
So that's great. I can, I can kind of use that in my ranking function to decide which of, which of those documents, one, two, or seven, is most relevant. I can do some ranking, some sort of secret source stuff. Um, and then I can decide that I want to, want to show the customer perhaps one of those documents. This thing down here is called a mapping file. And what it does is it maps these document numbers, one, two, and seven, actually out onto disk where the collection itself is stored. So you can see that document one exists over here on disk. Uh, this position and it says cat on the mat, so it does indeed contain the word cat. And then document two is over here, and uh, document seven is up here. But I'm only going to go and retrieve those when I'm showing the results to the customer. So that's sort of the core of what of, of the of the sort of the uh, data structure that's used within this within this compressed inverted index. Now I want to tell you something super cool about these compressed inverted indexes. This is something that's uh, that's uh, unnaturally excited me for a really really long time. And that is compression turns out to be super, super important. Remember I said before that these are highly compressed, so that they take 10 to 20% of the space of the collection? You know, I, I bet for most of you, the intuitive reaction was, well, that's a good idea because it saves space. Compression's a good thing, it saves space. It turns out that the most important reason for compressing documents in a search engine is actually for speed. Um, so let's just look at this graph over here on the left. This is the, this is the size graph. And what it basically says is that if I've got a... If I've got an index, an inverted index, and I don't use compression, I'm typically going to find that it's 30-something percent of the size of the collection. If I decide to apply some compression techniques to those integers that are stored within those inverted lists, then I'm typically going to be able to get that size down to somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, which, which is what we said earlier. So you might say, great, you know, we save a ton of space. But have a look at this graph over here on the right-hand side. I think this is the most interesting graph. And what it says is that if the collection is uncompressed, in this particular case, it's going to take oh, a little bit more than half a second to evaluate the query, on average. So lots of queries, you know, big timing experiment, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, if I do compression, in some cases, it turns out it gets slower. But check this out. For this particular compression scheme, which saves a lot of space, the querying is about twice as fast. So that's super cool. Why does that happen? Well, it turns out that the decompression cost is so small that we actually win by moving less data around. So with a single disk read, we can move more data, more information off disk in a single read than if it's uncompressed. And then the decompression cost is basically free. So we're able to move data around the system much faster and therefore evaluate the queries much faster. So it turns out that compression sort of has a double win in search and is really, really important in, in the infrastructure of most um, search companies today. Has this been the fastest whirlwind ever? Um, there's a lot of other things I could have talked about. I could, I could talk to you guys for a whole day. Um, we didn't talk about performance evaluation and relevance judgment. That's super important. You know, how is my search engine working? Is this ranking algorithm better than that ranking algorithm? Are customers more happy with this than that? A super, super important part of of building a search engine is, is navigating the space of improving your search engine relative to your competitors and improving your search engine relative to yourself. So, you know, deep, deep, deep area. Uh, we didn't really talk about crawling, indexing, sort of graph computation. You know, that's a fun, fun space to spend some time on. Spam and adult detection. Uh, the best I did was an anecdote. Um, internationalization, you know, super, super hard. Um, if you've ever worked on Chinese, Japanese, or Korean retrieval, it's a really, really difficult problem. Um, the really nice thing about English and a lot of languages that are similar to English is that you have words with spaces or other sort of um, word delimiting characters that separate those words. When you work with Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, you don't have that. And in fact, in a lot of cases, there's alternative ways that you can read the symbols and they sort of make sense in a dictionary sense, but they might not make sense to a native reader. So it turns out it's very, very difficult to tokenize, to break Chinese, Japanese, and Korean into words um, from a stream of characters. So really, really hard problem. Um, there's actually a whole research journal, uh, I think called TELOP, the Transactions on Asian Language Information Processing, like a whole journal that's dedicated entirely to the problems of large alphabet languages in information retrieval. So super, super hard. Um, a lot of other languages are pretty easy. Um, you know, most of the languages that bear some resemblance to English are easy. Um, Arabic and Hebrew turn out to be relatively easy, but, uh, but the large alphabet um, Asian languages are particularly problematic. 
tokenization, what is a word, what separates words, what do I do with apostrophes in the middle of words, all these kinds of things turn out to be really, really hard and interesting problems. Document summarization. It turns out the bane of the existence of most people who work on commercial web search is not really all of the things that I've talked about around sort of the, the, the computation involved with the index. Seeing those 10 little summaries at the end, going and getting 10 different documents, processing those and finding the relevant fragments to show to the customers. Super hard problem, super, super interesting. Online experimentation, so A-B testing with your customers. Um, really interesting area. Cluster and data center management. I think you know, search was really the first domain that wound up using tens and then hundreds of thousands of machines. And so it was sort of the, the pioneering area in, in sort of cluster and data center management and automation. Um, and you know, a lot of great stories from the old days about uh, all the problems that folks had, had doing that. Um, obviously become a much more mainstream field since then, but uh, you know, obviously a super, super important topic. Um, don't know any things off the top of my head that I kind of thought, hey, we, you know, I've, I've left out. I'm sure again, the ellipsis is uh, is very, very relevant. There's probably uh, a lot more things we could, a lot more things we could talk about. But I'm going to stop there. I'm going to let the Pinterest guys come up and and tell you a little bit, uh, a little bit what, about what's happening at Pinterest, and um, look forward to chatting to you afterwards. Thank you very much. Can you hear me at the end? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, just a friendly reminder, if you guys like you want to go to the restroom, it's right behind this wall. So you can follow the belt and go there. So yeah, thank you. Uh, we are excited today to have you all here and have this opportunity to tell you the you know our work is a search and the discovery domain. Uh, we are also honored to represent the, the entire discovery team here at Pinterest to provide you an overview of how we approach search and discovery differently. Uh, Pinterest's mission is to help people discover things they love and inspire them to go and do the things in their real life. So at Pinterest, when we talk about the term discovery, the scope in our mind is actually much broader than the traditional search, which you are familiar with. And Hugh did a very great job to summarize what the traditional search is, right? So in a traditional search engine, your concrete idea or the specific thing you are looking for can be formed as a search query. And you put it in a search box and magically get the results back from the search engine. And oftentimes, the best results. And the modern search engines, like Google and Bing are really good at that. However, at Pinterest, the problem we are trying to solve is very different. It's much broader. Even before you have the concrete idea and the specific thing you are looking for, we want to guide you there from a much more conceptual stage of your thinking. And think about even more. We want to, we want to show you the things you are going to love, even if you didn't know you were, what you are looking for. It sounds weird, but just think about it. there's many cases like that, right? Uh, for example, you may want to get a gift idea for your family during the holidays. Um, you want to do something for your backyard, but you just don't know what to do. And you know there is one item you have to buy to decorate your bedroom, but you just don't know what that item should be. So there are many questions like those where the best answer is the one you ultimately choose at the end. And it's very personal. So the, so the platform we are building here at Pinterest to solve this problem is called the Discovery Engine. So what is a Discovery Engine? Conceptually, it all starts from the user-curated data. So our user profiles and the boards created by our users and the pins, the content added to those boards, those objects are deeply connected among each other and essentially they form a massive network. We call it the interest graph, which I'll talk about in a second. So on top of that, we build the data models to describe the connections and the objects. And for engineers to use this model to process the data and to extract information necessary to build our discovery products, 
which includes search, recommendations, personalized home feed, and the topical feeds. And in this stack, the interest graph is really the very core to our discovery engine. It provides us not just the unique data set we can build our discovery products from, but it also provides us unique ways so that we can fundamentally do discovery different from any existing approaches. So what is the interest graph? From the engineering perspective, one simple way to describe the interest graph is that it is a massive network connecting people based on their shared interest. So what does that mean? Uh, let's look at this example. This is one of our users who obviously have pinned so many pins. And those pins, we also call them objects, can be pretty random to some other people. But to this user, she organized them in two collections. We call them boards. And she gave each board a label to describe what the, what the collection is. And this collection is from really this person's point of view. And in the world, there are some other pinners who also collect the similar objects and onto their boards with different labels. The overlap between the boards describe really the shared interest between the users and get them connected. It's worth noting that these type of connection, the users don't have to be friends and they don't have to even know each other. Also in this graph, you can notice that individual objects can now be connected by simply putting them in a collection, the board by our user. So what does this mean at the scale when there are tens of millions of users who are simultaneously and continuously pinning objects on their boards? It means that our users are curating this graph and they are connecting the world's objects together. It means that our users are essentially building the world's largest collection of human curated indexes. And this is a unique data set we're talking about. This is a unique data set we build all of our discovery products from. And again, this is a unique data set that enables us to do discovery fundamentally differently. Let me use one example to show you how that works. So one of the functionalities our discovery engine offers is to suggest related pins for any given pin. Um, for example, this is a typical pin added to our system, and we want to do recommendations for this pin. And obviously, this excited user put, you know, so pretty as a pin description and pinned this pin onto a board labeled as too cute. You know, if you happen to also work on relevance problems, you may agree with me, this is probably among the worst type of text signals you can possibly get from a user, right? Um, but we still want to do recommendations, so how do we do it? The idea we came up with is, of course, to use our human curated indexes. Since boards are naturally the collection of related objects, curated by human beings, probably smarter than any algorithm to date. What if we just grab pins from those boards and combine them together to make recommendations? That was actually exactly the first recommendation product we built and launched about one and a half years ago. And the product is called People Who Pin This Also Pin Recommendations. But things are actually not that simple. If we just randomly grab pins from those boards connected with the original pin and put them together as recommendations, you may end up with recommendations like this. It doesn't seem to be relevant to the original pin. Why? The reason is that at our scale, the views from our users on the same object might be very different and diversified. In this case, to some of the users, 
This golden retriever pin is just another metal yellow color image, right? And to some other users, this is just one more beautiful photograph. So the question is, how can we do a better job? And of course, the answer is to use the human curated indexes and the interest graph again. So in the interest graph, this pin is not isolated. There are many other users who repinned and pinned the same object onto their own boards. Although some of users didn't give us enough information as far as con you know, discovery is concerned, there are some other users you know, before they pin the pin into their collection, they bother to change the description to be something meaningful. And you can see like for some users, they started, you know, create the pin description and the keyword golden retriever started showing up. This is magic, but this is really just for our users. And also, most of users would still pin this object onto the boards that can naturally describe the category of this pin, and in this case, animal. And from the board labels, we can get some extra signals like dogs and pets, they all come up. And to use this fact, we build a data representation to describe the relationships among the boards and the pins. And the data representation is called pin join in our system, which is defined as a cluster of pins with the same image signature and all the information we can possibly collect and derive from all the pins in this cluster joined together. So it's pin join. So with the help from the pin join, it becomes relatively straightforward. We can go through all the pin description in the cluster and derive some meaningful and high quality text signals. And in this case, we were able to detect golden retriever, dog, and the pet as those high level and high quality text signals and we call them annotations. Similarly, we can go through all the boards contained in this pin join and use the board categories to finally derive the category for this pin cluster. And in this case, we were able to de detect a primary category, animal, with a high confidence score and the secondary cat category, photography, with a low confidence score. Um, in the next step, the information we derive from the pin joins get passed to all the boards that contain at least one of the pins in the cluster to derive extra signals and new signals useful for discovery and search purposes. And this is not the end. After that, the information from the boards gets further passed back to the pin joins to refine the signals and also to derive to improve the accuracy of the signals. And this is obviously done through iterations and the information will converge at the end. So let's go back to the original problem, how we can improve the recommendations with the help of the pin joins and the board's information. Um, now, conceptually, instead of randomly select pins from those random boards containing the same pin, right? And now with the help from the pin joins and board joins, we can first select only the boards with matched categories, and in this case, animals. And among the pins on the boards, now with the information calculated from their pin joins, we can define some meaningful relevance scores based on the categories, the text signals like annotations and image signals, and eventually we can rank them and select those highly relevant ones as the related pins. So as a result, this is basically the new recommendations after applying this algorithm based on the interest graph. Obviously, we have to do this at a scale. We have to calculate the recommendations for every single pin in our system. And the scale we're dealing with has tens of millions of billions of pins and hundreds of millions of boards. It's a big deal. Um, so this is the example how we do recommendations use our unique data set and it's different from any traditional approach. So over time, this, the same data, the same unique data set is used 
as a foundation to build all of our discovery products. Guided Search launched in April this year, and which fundamentally transformed the search from a one-dimensional product to two-dimensional by adding a discovery dimension with the exploratory guides. Email recommendations, delivering surprises to our users on a weekly basis, and related pin recommendations we just talked about, serving as a discovery window for our users to explore the interest of the graph starting from NA pin, anywhere in the system. And the home feed, the personalized home feed, the most personal recommendations built just for you, delivered right in your home feed. And finally, topical feeds, the place people with common interest, they can connect, they can share, and they can communicate. It's hard to believe none of these discovery products existed two years ago, which was the time we started building our discovery engine. For example, for the search query Cupcake, this is the search results you can get from our product now. And in, in, this, in this picture, you can see that we offer you the pins in the search results, but we also offer you the second dimension. We call them search guides to help you dis explore and discover new things. And oftentimes, you will be surprised by going down that option. Going back in time, this is the same query but the search results may look fundamentally different. This actually looks more like the traditional image search engine. And for those of you who have been our users for a long time, first of all, thank you. But you may, but you may have remembered what Pinterest search would look like for the same search query, Cupcake, two years ago. <laughs> we certainly made some progress. It's always amazing to me how much we have accomplished as a company during the past two years. It's the combination of the extraordinary effort from engineering, from product, and from design. It's fascinating. However, with the scale, with the complexity, and with the beauty of the discovery of I think this is supposed to be a video like this. So with the complexity, with the scale, and the beauty of the interest of graph, there is so much to learn, there's so much to explore, and there's yet so much to build. At Pinterest, we are really excited that we have this unique opportunity, and we feel fortunate we can fundamentally and potentially change discovery, what Google did for search. And this is going to be a long journey, and we just get started. With that, thank you. And <laughs> so next, I have Charles, our search infrastructure tech lead, to tell you more about search. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Charles Gordon. I lead the search infrastructure team here at Pinterest. So Hugh gave you an excellent overview of how search works in general. And I'm going to apply those lessons to Pinterest in an even more whirlwind tour of how we do search here. Everything from what happens when a user enters a search query to when the results arrive. But I'm going to start with a single pin because it's the most important thing on Pinterest. And this is one of my own pins because it's my talk and I can do that. Uh, the most important attribute of a pin, of course, is the image. Uh, it's the thing you see first. It's the most visible. Uh, and this image contains a LEGO Millennium Falcon being built by two LEGO master builders in Legoland in Anaheim in California. All those things are things we want to know about this image, and we want to find out from the other attributes of the pen, starting with the description of the pen, which is provided by the user when they pen it, moving on to the web page from which they penned it, which includes the title of the web page, the body text, meta tags from the web page, and any image caption we can extract from the image itself. We also, of course, have the board to which this image is penned. 
And the board is a very rich source of information. It has a title. It has a description. It has a category from one of our 32 top-level categories that users can apply to it. And of course, it has a ton of other pins, which are almost always thematically related to the pin in question. We, of course, have a user who found this pen interesting enough to put on one of their own boards. And that user often gives us information about themselves, their name, uh, the country they're coming from, the, uh, their gender, if they've provided as part of their profile, uh, the language they're speaking. And, of course, we have some social sharing options. We can give uh, users the ability to repen a pen onto their own boards, to like a pen, to share the pen with another user by sending it to them, and to share a pen on Facebook. And we can generate statistics from all that information. So I've given you a whirlwind tour of a single pen. What we do next in the search indexing process is we take all the pens that share the same image, we combine them together into something that we call the pen join, uh, which you saw a little earlier. So in this case, for this particular image, we have 500 plus pens that share it, penned by 500 users to 500 boards. And over the next few slides, we're going to walk you through the kind of data we see in a single pen join. So for instance, here are two websites that this image was penned from. These are two websites that three years later still have that image. Here's two websites that don't. One of these, I think, is actually spam. I think this was put in there as a chance to redirect users to this particular sales page. And one of them is kind of a scary Chrome message. There are four other websites that just don't exist anymore three years later, that they either don't exist in DNS or are park domains. And this is actually rather typical of pen joins, that there's some very good data and some out-of-date or noisy data. There are over 100 unique descriptions amongst those 500 pens for this image. These are the actual most descriptive ones. They include a lot of the terms I mentioned earlier, Legoland, California, names of characters from the movies, Millennium Falcon. These are more typical descriptions. <laughs> Any sort of sentiment analysis of Pinterest will come out amazingly positive. This is not Twitter. <laughs> we also get a ton of these very personal descriptions. People wanting to share these things with their friends and family and very excited to do so. So in addition to these text signals, we get a lot of statistics about pen joins. For instance, we know that this particular pen is penned more by men than women. Uh, and because Pinterest's audience is a little bit more like women, uh, this is a landslide victory for men. <laughs> Uh, we are predominantly U.S. still for our audience, but there's a large segment of Canadian, U.K., and French people penning this particular pen. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, people think Lego Millennium Falcons are for geeks and kids. Okay, so I told you about a pen and all its attributes and how we combine those attributes together to create a pen join. The next step in the search indexing pipeline is to create a search document from that. Now, a pin join is an incredibly rich data structure with way too much information. Sometimes these things can be upwards of 10 megabytes, uh, including tons of noisy text like you saw earlier, missing websites. So we have to distill out the best possible information from this pin join to index into our search documents. And we start with a very simple text pipeline. We take all the text signal, descriptions, board names, board titles, uh, anything we can extract from the image itself. We put it through this four-stage pipeline where we segment it. Hugh mentioned uh, that CJK languages, for instance, are very challenging to segment. This is the problem of separating text into words. Uh, we do a two-shingling, which is a fancy way of saying that we extract unigrams and bigrams from the text. And we use the unigrams as terms in the index and the bigrams as phrase matches. So we can do some of the phrase matching Hugh talked about. Uh, and we do some scoring. So obviously we want to know which terms we should index, which are most descriptive of the document in question. And we actually use the TF-IDF score that Hugh mentioned earlier to do that. So a single pin join can have many thousands of pins. Uh, and we have to choose a couple of them to show users when they do a search that matches that pin join. Uh, what we do now is we choose one pin from each country that represented in that pin join. So in this case, we've chosen three, one from the US, one from the UK, and one from France. Uh, we try to choose the best pen from each pen join. We measure that using a number of different factors, many of which you mentioned earlier, including things like how active the user is, how active the board is, how thematic the board is, how complete the description is, how good the link is. Does that link still contain the image? Is it still a link? And we finally get a search document 
unigrams, bigrams, canonical pens, and then a bunch of statistics, which I've only listed a few of here, that we'll use later to score these documents. So now we know everything we need to know to actually talk about what happens when a user searches on Pinterest. So when a user types Lego Millennium Falcon into a search box and hits return, the very first thing we do is to construct a query. And in this case, the query contains everything you know about me. The query itself, my name, the country I'm coming from right now using geo.ip, uh, the, the locale of my browser or mobile device, which is a hint about the language I'm using, and the gender uh, that I've provided at sign-up time. The next thing for us to do is to run this query through a number of query processing modules. The same way we want to join information at the pin join stage, we want to gather as much about this query as we can so we can do the best possible job of matching it to documents. We do some language detection. It's actually very common for people from other countries, even when they specify a different language, to search in English, uh, or vice versa in some cases. Um, so we want to make sure that we have the right language when we do stemming, stop wording, and synonyms later. Uh, we do some categorization. So we happen to know that this uh, search is a geek search for the most part. So we're going to apply that category to this search. And we're going to try to look for documents later that match that category. Finally, we'll do some things like query writing and spell correction. Uh, so query writing we do when we have a very long query that we know is not going to match a lot of documents. And we'll either remove some words or, or rewrite some of them to similar words to try to get them to match a much better document or set of documents. Uh, for instance, if I had spelled millennium with one L here, or with one N, or both, uh, we would try to give you some corrections here that would search later on and get you the right documents. One other thing I want to talk about very quickly that's not relevant to this query is an experiment we're running, uh, which is a lightweight gender personalization. If you came to Pinterest right now and searched for shoes, you'd see this, which is primarily women's shoes. If you were a man, we would prefer you saw this. We have incredibly rich content for men on Pinterest, but because the audience is primarily female, the most popular stuff tends to come to the top, and that's female pens. Uh, in this case, we're now doing an experiment for a very small set of queries, like shoes, belts, watches, to implicitly convert the query from men to something like this. Uh, so you get a much better experience. You get connected to things that actually interest you. So finally, um, we have the final query. There is no gender personalization for this one, so we just leave that empty. The next step, of course, is to match it against the giant database of documents. Uh, and this particular query matches a couple thousand documents. So of course, we can't show you all of them. We need to sort them in order, some order, as Hugh noted. Uh, we do that using, of course, a number of techniques. Uh, we look at the text match, are all the terms in every document. Do they appear next to each other? Is there a phrase match? Uh, we look at the country. Actually, one of the interesting things we do is we boost by the country you're coming from. So if you search for football in the UK, you will get very different results than if you search for football in the US. In fact, you'll get soccer in one and football in the other. We do that very simply by just looking at the mix of users who are pinning that particular pen. Uh, we do some things with cat query categorization. So we will try to boost pens that have the same category as the query you specified. Uh, we, of course, look at quality signals. We want to show you the most high-quality content at the top. And the quality signals are all the things I mentioned earlier, link quality, board quality, description quality, um, users being followed by a lot of other users and being active. Uh, and finally, we do a little bit of recency boost, where we try to show you the most recent pens at the top. And so the search results change a little bit over time. The end result of all of that is the uh, search results, which include the one we started with way up there at the top. Pinterest has an incredibly rich set of data, hand curated by users to their boards from across the web. And I've shown you just a little bit about how we combine that data into these very rich data structures that give us a lot of insight into these images. There are a tremendous amount of problems left to be solved. We have done just the basic starting of a major search index. And I think it's very exciting to see where we can go from here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm, my name is Ri Zhang. I'm the manager of the search team. Uh, currently, we have eight engineers working on indexing, serving, quality, and also features. So everything about the search. So as you know, like earlier this year, we launched the guided search. Pinterest search used to be one-dimensional. You type a search query and scroll through all the contents until you find the things that you are interested in. 
With scattered search, we added another dimension to the search results that you can scroll horizontally to find the topics that are different and go down that path. So today, I'm going to talk about the story behind the guided search launch. As you know, like many users, when they start a search, they don't have like a clear keyword in mind. People interested in travel may type a query travel, and then they will get a lot of opinions about travel, various content. Some users may notice like this beautiful beach, uh, and then start a search for travel or beach. Some other users may notice this glass igloo in Finland and start to search for travel Europe. And after user uh, find the destination that they want to go to, people start searching for travel tips and uh, get a lot of ideas like how to pack your suitcase. So this is probably the easiest on web, but not so easy on mobile devices where the screen is small and the typing is not so convenient. So how can we make it easier and also with more fun? So our designer, Jason Wilson, started to think about this problem at the beginning of this year. After many sleepless nights, he came up with this guided search design that after you type a search query, sorry, yeah. After you type a search query, and we show a bunch of the guide selections that you might find interesting and explore. So the design is very elegant and simple. But how can we come up with meaningful suggestions that are both interesting to user and people find useful information after clicking it? There are two problems here. So first, we need to come up with good text suggestions. And second, for those text suggestions, we need to find out the best relevant thumbnails for those suggestions. So for the first problem, we revisited like a user's search patterns. In the previous example, users searched for travel. In many times, they also searched for travel beach. There is usually a reason behind that action, and it indicates that we could possibly use beach as a guide candidate for query travel. Similar for search pattern like travel to travel Europe and also travel to travel tips. We consider beach Europe tips all as guide candidate for the query travel. So the next thing that we did is we also look at the search results for given query. As we mentioned earlier, we have text annotations for almost every pin on Pinterest in this query search result. For the top pin there, we have a text annotation Europe. And for the pin on the top right, we have annotation destinations. Therefore, we can consider Europe and the destinations both as guide candidates for the query travel. So, these are one of the, there are two of the many ways that we come up with guide candidates, and we select the top ones that we think users are likely to you pick and also get useful information. So the next big thing is, how can we come up with relevant thumbnails for those guides? Naturally, Pinterest is the best source for that. In this example, for the guide tips of travel, we look at the search results of travel tips, and we select the best pin that's good use for a thumbnail, blur it with a dominant color, and then put it as a background for the tip. Now, all of those guides, now all of those guides have relevant thumbnails behind them. Lastly, we also localize the guide suggestion based upon where you are from and also whether you are a man or woman. In this example, uh, people in United Kingdom will get London as the first suggestion for search street style, while male users in the US will get men as the first guide suggestion. Since we launched the guided search in April this year, we have continued to improve the coverage and also the quality of the search guide suggestion. Now, guided search has become an important part of search experience on Pinterest, 
and it also differentiates us from other search engines like Google or Bing. Thank you all. With that, I will have our next talker, speaker, uh, Kevin Jin, talk about the visual discovery. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, just waiting for slides to load up. Oh, OK. Here we go. Ah, let me go back. Hi, I'm Kevin, and uh, I am here to present visual search at Pinterest. I came here a little less than a year ago through the acquisition of Visual Graph, a company I co-founded with two other Googlers. Um, and before that, I was a scientist at Google Research for a couple of years. And as you can see, I spent my entire career on visual search, and I'm here to share why I'm so excited to be here at Pinterest. Um, to start, let me, let me talk about the product itself. Pinterest is considered as a visual discovery tool that mimics how you interact and discover things in the real world. For example, when you're visiting Paris or go to an art gallery or go to a shopping mall, you discover things that you may like. In this case, you may do two things. First is you interact with the object and then make a purchase right away. Or you take a photo of this particular object that you share with your friends or you, uh, you save it for later use. Pinterest is very similar. You go on the site, you browse, you discover, you buy, and, and, you, and you save. Now, since you're making your decisions purely on visual information, which are captured on those 200 by 500 pixels, it's very natural to think that computer vision or visual search will play a very dominant role in how visual discovery works at Pinterest. And that's why I'm very, very excited to be here. In the next 10 minutes, I'll talk about two things. First is, what is possible with visual search? What are the latest technologies we can use to apply to our products? Second is, what's next? What are the opportunities that's available to us, specifically to Pinterest? Let's go back in history. Let's take a look at what's happening in computer vision or especially visual search for the past 10, 12 years. Many of you working in this field knows that these are the key developments in visual search, starting from 2002, um, early 2000s, Henry Rollins face detectors, Villa Jones detectors, or face detectors. Then three years after that, there is um, a local feature such as SIFT, give you uh, invariance to, look at, uh, to translation, rotation, and scaling. Allows you to take a picture of a book cover, for example, and match it across different pictures of that book cover. Now we have visual vocabulary, uh, allows you to essentially index images similar to text-based search for fast and efficient indexing. In the last two, uh, two, two to four years, we, we see rapid improvement in object recognition and image classification, classification based on uh, both parts-based models and also um, uh, deep, deep learning or convolution neural nets. Now, the, the graph above this line shows the features and products companies have thought, um, has, has built largely based on those technology. When I joined Google in 2004, image search is still black and white. We most use text information to, for, for ranking. So the first um, tool we built with Henry Rowley is really the safe search, the point filter, combining a face detector together with skin pixel color detection. And that's to improve things. Um, as technology such as, the, uh, such as local features and visual vocabulary, visual vocabulary matures, uh, we see more and more products from, from Google, from Amazon, uh, such as Google Goggles, Image Search, Amazon Flow, all based on variations of those technologies. And in the recent two to three years, we see very, very exciting developments in object recognition and, uh, and image classification. That's where you see face recognition, and you see uh, <clears throat> Google able to search your own photos based on image classification. Very, very exciting time for computer vision and visual search. Um, let me show some concrete examples of, of what you can do, what you can build um, in a company such as Pinterest. So the first problem is image annotation. The problem is, given this query image, what are the most likely annotations you can assign to this image. You can use that for search, for recommendation. And this is the tool we built uh, four or five months after we came to Pinterest uh, using this set of technologies. Uh, essentially, so here we give a, uh, we, we copy a new image and we paste that into the kind of the live annotation uh, engine and you can see the image annotations we generate on the fly. And we can then we can use that information to, to index to, uh, to, to for, for search. 
another example we will show is um, the, the, this clock. Once you pin this clock onto the boards, we have no recommendations because we have no semantic information. Now you can if you just copy and paste this particular image into the live um, annotation engine that we, we built. So, and how, how, how does it work? Well, uh, so actually, this is the way to use such, such, uh, such system. Once a person pins an image, in the previous case, we have no recommendations because there's no data. Now we can because we know something about this particular image. So how does this work? Um, it's actually a very similar to what Google has been doing for the last couple of years. Essentially, two pipelines. First pipeline is given a new image. You go fetch the new dupes from buildings of image database. Then you transfer the label from that image to the query image. And what's very interesting about Pinterest is that each image is also a collection of pins. Every single time a person repins a photo, it adds new data into that, um, that, that pin joins. And we can use the information to annotate this image. So we have a unique opportunity to use a much larger set of very rich information to annotate, to solve the problem of image recognition, uh, of image annotation. And of course, we have a new image. Then we simply just run this through a deep learning pipeline trained using Pinterest data. And that seems to work fairly well. Um, so the next um, part that, that's quite interesting using the latest computer vision is object search. Um, the later, you know, Google image search uses the entire image as a query. Uh, but it does not work in most cases. In many cases, if you're interested in this bag, um, you know, what, what, what can you do? And if you know the location, if you localize this bag on this image, then you know the color of this bag, you know the shape of this bag. Then you're able to do some sort of the very clever search results, such as the one on the right side. You know, we only show results with yellow bags in this kind of shape. And this is the second demo that I want to show you. Uh, we're in active experiment of this particular feature. Um, and uh, for example, this is the board that's created by our product uh, manager, Sarah Tabell. And I'll show you how it works. Um, if you're interested in that particular shoe, you click on the shoe, and a dot shows up. You can click on the dots and to see kind of similar looks. And um, you, know, you can use that to comparison shop or to find things that's even better. Now we go back and find some other images. We scroll down uh, the boards and we find this particular pin. This is a very interesting pin because it's a collage of multiple objects, such as shoes, sunglasses, bags, and dresses. Now we actually detect every single object on this pin and put a red dot on top of it. So you can click on the dots and we show visually similar results on the right side. Sunglasses visually similar results on, uh, on the right side. So we don't treat an image as an entire image. We treat image as multiple parts. And that makes a very interesting search experience. Let's try something even harder. Uh, let's try a fashion, a uh, like street fashion photo, the one on the uh, one over here. And we have dots on the backs and on the shoes. And you click on the backs, and we can see you, I can show you product images similar to that particular bag. Um, let's try one more image. This is a more difficult image because the bag is it's a real world setting and it's a little bit tilted. We can still do object recognition on this photo and give you some interesting search results. Let me go through them. This is a new dupes of the current image. So it's a very easy case, right? But then look at this image. Now it's a different person, different outfits, different background. But we still match the bag inside the image. The bag inside the image. And, and here's some, some other results that we can find. I mean, it, it may not be the exact brand, but you can see that similar shape, similar color, and it's something that you may want to buy if you don't like the original, um, if you don't like the original query. Okay, let's go next. So what's next at Pinterest? Right, I'm showing you something that we can already do. What, 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 what's next? What can we do next? So. My, my, my thesis is that great product leaps come from both technology innovation and also a new source of human-generated data. For example, Google is founded on the intuition that by combining PageRank, which is, which is a technical innovation, with Hyperlink, which is a new source of user-generated data, that creates a, success, a very successful search engine and a business out of it. 
Facebook, very similar. Facebook enjoyed a rapid growth based on photo sharing. And the photo sharing is powered by both the face detection, which is technology, and user tagging, which allows you to, quick, uh, to quickly share and your photos with your friends. So what's next? What is visual search plus interest graph? To, to recap, what is interest graph? Given this image on this side, you pin it, right? You pin it, you add this to your board, which essentially makes connections of this image to other images in the world. Then your friends does the same thing, again and again, essentially enlarge this graph. Now you connect this image with other images on Pinterest. What can you do about it? So this is the results you get if you use one of the leading um, deep learning software providers. And this is the query image, and those are the search results on, on, on the right side. And this is what we can do at Pinterest. The results on the left are actually by using our own deep learning pipelines. As you can see, it's not, it's not very good. But by combining, the visual, uh, by combining the visual information together with the interest graph, we get a much better search results. It's personalized, and it's also captured the subtle differences in different type, types of shoes. Now, I will show you one demo that we are working on right now. We're experimenting, but it's not public yet. I call this flashlight. Um, now we have this little flashlight on the top, and if you click on them, that allows you to crop any part of the image. On, and we, in real time, we show you the search results on the right side. Now we insert another flashlight on this flower, on this vase. Take a look at the results on the right side. We move, we, <clears throat> we move the flashlight onto the painting, onto the wall. <laughs> and we do this for the mirror. And this is a combination of both computer vision and traversing on the visual graph, on, on, on the interest graph. Very, very exciting. And this is just the, tips of, the tip of the iceberg of what we can do. And for any machine learning computer vision person, this is like a gold mine that will keep us occupied for many years to come. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right. I told you that we would finish strong. Thank you so much for your time you spent here. It's been a great team. We're really proud of what we're doing here. The thing I keep on telling the team, and as I think you will learn, most of Pinterest has not been built yet. We're really proud of the discovery platform and the work they're doing. Thank you all. If you have any questions, there's a lot of people running around with Pinterest shirts, so be happy to answer them. Thank you all, and take care.